Well, I mean, you can't really tell now, but if you want to try guard, it looks like one person is tied. I'm sure it would be good to break, good to break the, the field of the ball. So. and staff and administrators and students who all selected this book and sent it to you over the summer. We hope that you enjoyed it and learned as much from it as we did. I suspect that I was asked to do the introductions today because I was the person who nominated What is the What as the common reading for the class of 2015. In fact, I not only nominated the book, I actively campaigned for the book on the committee, and perhaps in some overexcitement on a couple of occasions even stomped my foot. <laughs> if it turns out that you hated this book, you can blame me, and if you loved it, I hope that you will blame all the other members of the committee when you find out who they are. You should know a bit about our process. The committee read a number of terrific books last spring before selecting what is the what. And curiously, the book that ran a close second, that is the book about which we vigorously debated and almost selected, was this one. Zaytun, a book also by Dave Eggers, the author of What is the What? Zaytun is a story about a Syrian American man who lived through the climatological and post-Hurricane Katrina horrors in New Orleans, Louisiana. It too is a fine book and we recommend it to you. But you might be asking yourself, if we had two great books by Dave Eggers, why did we select this one? Let me tell you why I thought it was a better choice over Z2. Simple. What is the what is a more complicated, more challenging, and at least to my mind, a more interesting story that is also a fine piece of literature. I learned a great deal about what is the what. I am, after all, a farm kid from Kansas. And I suspected that all of you would be up to the greater intellectual challenge that is posed by Valentino Ding's story, even though What is the What is more than 200 pages longer than Zaytun. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fact of university. <clears throat> no one comes to McAllister thinking it's going to be a cakewalk, right? Valentino's story educated me, and it moved me very deeply. Even though I've been to Africa, that is Egypt, only once, and I don't think I know anyone from the Sudan. <laughs> but I found myself caring about Valentino, his family, and his friends, and I still think of them whenever I hear news about the violence and politics that are occurring in Africa today, Southern Africa. But that's one of the great strengths of literature, yes? The capacity to temporarily free us in the constraints of our own situations, our own geographic locations, even our own identities. Literature helps us to walk in someone else's steps. Now, I first learned about what is what quite by accident. One day at lunch, I overheard my, fr I overheard my friend and colleague, Jim Dawes, here on the podium, professor in the English department. He was talking about this book and how he teaches it in one of his classes. I love a good story as much as the next person, and I was so intrigued by Jim's comments that I went out and got the book, read it, and you might say I began to change the way I see the world as a result of Valentino's story. So when, finally, the committee selected what is the what, 
I knew exactly who should be asked to present at this program today. My friend and colleague, Diane Chandy. <laughs> and of course, Jim Dawes. So let me introduce our two speakers. Diana is the chair of the Anthropology Department at McAllister, and she's also the director of the African Studies Program. Her scholarly research is on the experiences of the Sudanese refugees to the United States and on the practices of forced migration. You might say that she has written the non-fiction equivalent of what is the what in her own book entitled Newer American Passages. She is also co-authored with McAllister Professor of Economics, Kareem Mo, an acclaimed book called Glass Scenes and 100 Hour Couples, What the Opt-Out Phenomena Tells Us About Work and Family. After Professor Sandy speaks, we will hear from Professor Jim Dawes. He is chair of the English department, and he is the director of McAllister's Human Rights and Humanitarianism program. Professor Dawes is also an author. He has written the book, That the World May Know, Bearing Witness to Atrocity, and also the author of the book, The Language of War. Diana Shandy and Jim Dawes' scholarly work is in fact very well known. They are frequently commentators in the media. I hear them giving interviews on television and on the radio more than occasionally, and I see their work cited in newspapers and magazines. Diana and Jim today will talk about what is the what, but they'll do so from different ways and informed by their own scholarly training. And in this respect, I think they quite accurately will reflect the various ways of knowing that you too will experience in your years at McAllister. Now, a warning. Professor Dawes intends to lead you, yes, all 480, some of you, in a discussion about Latino's story. And so I urge you to participate with him, answer his questions, share your perspective so he doesn't have to, I don't know what, lecture on the fly. Be bold this afternoon. And following Professor Dawes' presentations, I will moderate the discussion and our speakers will take questions from you and listen to your own views and perspectives about what is the what. And we will do that prior to adjourning to your small group orientation, clan, McAllister discussions of this book. So with no more ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Diana Shandy. Good afternoon and welcome to McAllister. Thank you for that very kind introduction and to Adrian Christensen and Ann Minnick for the invitation to participate in your orientation. Um, since many of you are new arrivals to Minnesota, I thought I would start off by telling you what brought me here to McAllister. So, when my husband is in the room, I'm always uh, quick to say that, of course, he is the reason that I left my really, really cool apartment in the East Village of New York City to move to St. Paul. But, between us, that's kind of a lie. It was, in fact, the new air. So, allow me to set the stage. It's January 1996. I'm wearing a borrowed parka. I fly in from New York to visit this guy I ultimately marry. We're invited to a party, this really bizarre local ritual that I hope all of you get the opportunity to take part in, called a winter barbecue. So there, we're grilling burgers, veggie burgers, amidst five foot high snow drifts, and I'm the person who's got a hold of the paper and I'm handing it to the guy who's doing the fire, and I'm bored, so I uh, start to read the newspaper that I'm holding, and there my jaw dropped, because I started reading this article that let me know that newer people who, and other people from southern Sudan were being resettled in Minnesota as refugees. The New Air, as you know from reading Dave Egger's book, What is the What, are a cattle-keeping population like the Dinka who have historically resided in southern Sudan. What you may not know, however, is that they also happen to be one of the most celebrated anthropological populations of all time. They were studied in Sudan in the 1930s and written about by the late, great, 
British social anthropologist Sir Edward E. Evans Pritchard in a series of three books. And here's a, a picture of Sir, Sir Evans Pritchard and um, one, of, one of these three books here. So for anthropologists, New Era as refugees in places like Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Memphis, Tennessee, and St. Paul, Minnesota in the 1990s really challenged anthropological paradigms in intriguing ways. They raised issues that shook up the discipline by posing questions about the relationship between culture and territory, the meaning of home, and the anthropological unit of analysis. Much like Eggers, I quickly got pulled into the compelling, tragic, humbling, inspiring stories Sudanese refugees told me. And I ultimately wrote my doctoral dissertation on the multi-layered structural parameters, dynamic social processes, and individual strategies associated with the ongoing and open-ended incorporation of Sudanese refugees in the United States beginning in the 1990s. Slide up over here. Um, and in this photo here, this is um, this is a McAllister student, a new air friend that I worked with um, in my research, and my daughter who was uh, much younger at the time. So for others, for non-anthropologists such as policymakers, human services providers, and refugee studies specialists, new air and other Southern Sudanese signaled a shift in the composition of immigration flows to America we can quite neatly situate the very particular individual experience that Eggers describes of Valentino attack Dane within this larger contextual framework. As a social scientist, I'm interested in the particular experience of forced migration that Eggers describes, but I'm also interested in the broader political, economic, and cultural forces that, that shape such behavior. The 1990s witnessed the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union. From a U.S. immigration standpoint, we see in this period the arrival of Bosnians from Eastern Europe, and as a result of this disintegration of Cold War politics in Africa, a number of African refugee populations. In fact, the United States received more immigrants from Africa in the 1990s than had arrived in the previous 180 years right, or since the days of the, the transatlantic slave trade. So a really significant and important decade. This historical pivot in immigration played out in a variety of ways across the United States, with an eye toward the local context. According to a report from the Minnesota State Demographer's Office in 2002, or around the time the processes that Eggers describes are taking place, 13,522 immigrants came to Minnesota from 160 different countries and every continent except Antarctica. So for many of these, the country, for many of these countries, the number of immigrants was less than 50, and for 60 of them, the number of immigrants was 10 or fewer. So it's important, therefore, to think of the processes that Eggers describes as a part of a much larger and complex set of issues we might think of as the globalization of migration. Currently, there are roughly 30,000 Sudanese refugees resettled in the United States. About 4,000 or so are a part of the population of so-called lost boys. Before the 1990s, however, there was very little permanent Sudanese migration to the United States, to North America, in fact, and it was really limited to people from northern rather than southern Sudan. So with the exception of a small number of Sudanese students, the resettlement of five to 10,000 southern Sudanese beginning in the 1990s really represented a new migratory flow. This differentiates them from a population like Kosovar Albanians who came in the late 1990s and had an established ethnic community upon arrival. The existence of a co-ethnic population is a very important variable in looking at migration and integration patterns. So to fully appreciate the role of Mary Williams, Phil and Stacy Mays, and others like them that Eggers describes, 
you really need to appreciate the arrival of the so-called lost boys within this framework of a relative lack of an existing co-ethnic population. We see an expansion of the social space for the role of what we might call lay humanitarians. Another interesting dynamic of Southern Sudanese migration to the U.S. is that they arrived as refugees. For refugees, in many cases, the U.S. kind of acts like that relative that we see in other forms of migration for people who would otherwise have lacked the social and economic capital to involve in migrating from Africa to the U.S. Quite frankly, the likelihood that someone from Valentino Achak Deng's set of circumstances to migrate to the U.S. through a student, a laborer, or a tourist visa designation is practically nil. Therefore, the category of refugee is really essential to explaining his arrival in the United States and invokes the role of the state in key ways. So, thus far, I've described how Southern Sudanese fit within the discipline of anthropology. I told you a bit about the serendipitous connection that launched my own research with this population. I've spoken about Southern Sudanese as emblematic in the shifting terrain of refugee resettlement in the United States. And what I would like to leave you with as I wrap up my introductory comments is to say a little bit about how Southern Sudan fits within Africa. So first, who can tell me what historic event took place in Sudan this past July? Say again. South Sudan became its own country. Indeed, on July 9, 2011, Africa gave birth to the world's newest nation, South Sudan. I was two days drive away in northern Uganda with, with, my, um, with my children. I just decided it wasn't good to take the young kids. and I just wasn't sure what was going to happen, but we, we all raised glasses of beer and had a big toast um, when, when South Sudan was born on July 9th. It was very exciting. Um, to me, the hippos, the Nile River, and, and I was cheering South Sudan. So here's one image that I think captures this. Just pause a minute, another one. So, in fact, Sudan is in the curious situation, I was figuring this out as I was putting together my comments for, for this talk, of being both the first and the last sub-Saharan African country to gain independence from colonial rule. Yes, yes, I know some of you are saying, no, 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 she's wrong, it was Ghana. And in fact, Ghana frequently is advanced as the first sub-Saharan or black African country to gain its independence from colonial rule, even though Sudanese independence on January 1, 1956 predated Ghana's on March 6, 1957 by more than a year, but that's really an artifact of the discursive carving up of the continent into so-called North Africa and sub-Saharan Africa. So South Sudan hasn't moved, right? Geographically, it's still in the same space, but it's kind of how we think of um, the nation state that, that shifts that framing. So as you well know from reading Eggers, from 1983 to 2005, the Khartoum government located in Northern Sudan was engaged in a war with Southerners who were seeking self-government. The conflict in Sudan frequently is attributed to um, binary social distinctions based on geography, north-south, ethnicity, Arab-African, and religion, Muslim Christian. Of course, as the ongoing crisis in Darfur illustrates, these are fluid categories and it's a much more complex situation. From a southern perspective, northern Muslim Arabs entered their land in the 1800s looking for ivory and slaves. Northerners were favored under colonial rule, which gave them more power and increased tension with people such as the Nuer and the Dinka, other people living in the south. The 2005 Comprehensive Peace Agreement between Southern rebels and the Khartoum government went into effect. And those of us who follow Sudan have remained cautiously optimistic ever since. As of today, September 5, 2011, there are outbursts of violence in South Sudan. 
Darfur in Western Sudan remains an unresolved situation, and tensions are heating up in the Nuba Mountains in South Kordofan. Um, and just to give this all a very thoroughly 21st century twist, the President of the Republic of Sudan, what's now North, what's North Sudan, known colloquially as North Sudan, so the President Omar al Bashir um, has a warrant out for his arrest by the International Criminal Court in The Hague on charges of genocide and crimes against humanity. So clearly, the Sudan is a complex place. Dave Eggers emerges as an able steward in guiding the reader through an incredible set of events. Dave Eggers, however, doesn't and shouldn't get the final word on Sudan or on refugee migration. But what is the what provides an excellent point of entry into a set of multi-layered issues that should matter to us all. On that note, it is my pleasure to turn the discussion over to my colleague, Professor Jim Dawes. My brother is a comedian, and he gives comedic comedy things all over the country. And I, I go and hear him talk, and he always sort of trots up to the mic and says, how y'all doing? And people scream and hoot and holler because they've had their, their mentor at first year at the comedy club. And I had this idea that someday I'd have a group of people I could do that with. Um, so how y'all doing? <laughs> Fairly you all can understand the depth of the sibling rivalry. Um, so, so this is a crazy situation for me to be in with all you people here. The whole theory of a place like McAllister is that this is just nonsense as education have all you anonymous cases. Um, I can't teach unless I know people's identity, your name, how you learn, how you don't learn. So I'm going to pretend, as Adrian pointed out, that this is a seminar and we're all just going to talk. Um, and if the weight of a thousand gazes is too hard for you and you can't um, answer my questions, I'll just sort of soft hook style pretend to talk. Um, so, okay, so, so this is a good book, right? I like this book. There's a problem with this book. Which is that it's real exciting, so you read it for the plot, right? You want to find out, does he get the girl? Does a, a lion eat his friend? Like, you want to find all this stuff out. Um, but it's really best, I think, to read it as a poem. So I'm going to show you the first page of this book. Just, and this is how you should be reading this book. In fact, I think one thing that we're going to do in the calendar in the next four years is to teach you to read everything like a poem, whether it's a, a, an email from your lover, phone call from your parents, a politician's speech. Whenever anyone uses words to try and affect you, they're doing lots of stuff with their words that you're not quite noticing often. And if you can figure out the details of how people suddenly use language to make emotional and cognitive changes in you, then you can do the same and change your world more effectively. So we're going to talk about that. You've all had the experience of reading good books and bad books, right? The things we're going to talk about now, even though almost certainly you didn't notice them when you read them, are the difference between a good book and a bad book. A book where you care about the main character, you read, you laugh with this fictional person, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, versus a book where you just not touch, right? You don't, you don't feel a connection to the characters. Uh, the reason they're different is because they're very small things that are done to make you have feelings at a subconscious level that prime you so that when the real feelings come out, they'll be quite powerful. So, we're going to do that. Is the sound, is the sound kicking in and out, or is it steady? It's good. Um, so what I would like you to do, class, is I would like you to read the first two paragraphs like a poem. And, and really, you can even focus on the first two sentences. Um, and I'll give you some clues, just since, since this is an artificial setting. Look for Repetition is always crucial, right? Like if an author repeats something, it's like they're grabbing you by your lobe and saying, pay attention. Um, odd word choices, anything really that strikes you, but first two paragraphs, and also we we'll probably won't get past the first two sentences in the next 15 or 20 minutes. So take, take a couple seconds.
All right, all ready? So, if you were in class, I'd say, what did you notice? Oh, my favorite person in the calendar, who are you? What's your name? Christina Scott? Cynthia Scott. I will be, I will be looking for you in English classes in the future. Okay, icebreaker, what did you notice? So she says there's no comma after the door, which is a natural place for the comma, right? That's what you're saying. That's interesting. I, I hadn't ever actually thought about that, but that, as you say, that it does strike me that um, it's kind of a, it's a very slight grammatical jar. Like you expect a pause, but instead you're kind of rushing forward. So instantly the grammar is setting up for a slightly, perhaps fast moving situation, right? Um, I'm gonna. Uh, I think I saw you with. Uh, is your hair red? Yeah. Okay. Right. Interesting. Right, yeah. She has, he has no reason to answer the door, she points out, suggesting, like, this guy has no reason to go to the door if he's got no connections to the external world. It's interesting that you focus on that I have no, too. Um, uh, so, so you, I have no, you want to pay attention to, because it's the first words of the book. Authors kill themselves over the first words. So that's really important to pay attention. And then you'll notice, I have no is repeated. Right? I have no, I have no. And then, in like this fireworks moment to your subconscious, it's repeated again with a negation at the end of the second paragraph, which is sort of a it's prime real estate for language, right? I have no reason not to answer the door. I have no tiny round window. And then skip down. I do have. So this is huge. This is structurally gigantic. And, and, and the reason it's important for him, so let's say you go into a bookstore, right? And you're looking for a book to, to read on the plane back to Grand Forks, um, Idaho, Iowa. Where is that, Grand Forks? North Dakota, anyone from Grand Forks here? OK, we can make fun of um, um, You're going back to Grand Forks, and you buy, you buy a book. And you're like, Dave Eggers, right? I'll buy this. Sure, right? It's probably about MTV or something. Um, the title doesn't give you much. So you open the first page and it says, I have no, I have no. And before you were thinking, what is the what? That's like the stupidest title ever, right? What is the what? We have, what, what is the what? I don't know. You don't know what this book's going about. But now, in the first three words, you know everything you need to know about the book. Like the whole plot has been set in your mind. I have no, I have no. You know right away, this is going to be a plot of subtraction. This is going to be a book that's about a man who has everything taken away from him. Piece by piece. His mother, his family, his home, his village, his country, his continent, his name. Everything will be taken from this man. And the central philosophical question of this book is, what's left of a man when you've taken everything away? Is, is there anything left? That's what this book is worried about. So this, this is, you just opened it up, and already your brain is starting to like subconsciously worry about this kind of issue, even before you know you're worried about it. And then you get to, I do have. Now this again, you're ready, like this is like, okay, whatever he has, it's gotta be big, because it's gonna go against like the decimation of his whole life, right? What does he have? Phones, yes. Phones are so interesting in this book. Um, they're almost like existential answers. So practically speaking, phones are important because, um, I'm sorry, I'm ignoring you over there. Um, phones are important because the way people were settled, like when you settle people in the US from other countries, they don't take you all, like you're all, let's say you all are a group, and you were emotionally injured and physically injured, but you bond it and you help each other, right? We don't take you all and send you to Grand Forks, uh, North Dakota together, right? We don't do that. That would be bad because you all are a cultural block. And we don't want cultural blocks coming and affecting our, our cultural blocks. So we'll take you with a skeleton shirt and put you in Grand Forks alone so that we can change you instead of you changing us, right? So this, Eggers is kind of pointing out right from the start that there's refugee processes are 
kind of salvation, but they're also kind of injury. And he's highlighting that with this notion of the foam, because all they had when they get there, to connect themselves to that group that was so important to them, was the foam. That's it, right? And here's why it's an existential. It's like either super hopeful or super despairing. It's super hopeful in that, um, like everywhere he goes, his village gets burnt down, right? They're always burning his village down. Whatever, wherever he goes, people are all attacked and killed. And finally, when he gets to America, he finally has a village that can't be burned down. This village, this imaginary village, this imagined community in the telephone, right? You can kill somebody in that village, in fact they do, but you can't get them all. They're all dispersed, they're all safe. It's this perfect, finally safe space for the lost ones. You can't burn that town down. The town of the telephone. So that's hopeful, but it's also so pathetic. It's so tragic. It's, it's the final symbol of human loss and alienation. Because that's not even a pale imitation of a home, right? That's, that's, that's just homelessness. His home is a kind of homelessness. If that's his final answer, then that's just existentially devastating. Right, so that's the phone then. So, so already, like, a lot's going on. You, you've probably skated through it. You know, you whatever's going to happen. Already your brain is doing all this work. You feel better. Um, all right, other, other notes in moments. Can you back to share with the class? Yeah. Right, so the opening paragraph has a sense of foreboding. That's really, that's really super interesting. Like when you get to the second paragraph, I saw her in the parking lot. I saw her standing. There's all this language of like, like the witness to a crime. So you know something bad is about to happen. The focus on the details, like he's about to remember. Like she had a red eye, sweatshirt, she's kind of heavy, you know, like talking to the cops or something. So yeah, really interesting. That, that sets up an ominous tone. He's saying it's very spare, the language very stark, sets you up for that. When you said window, the window, did you, what kind of window is there? That's weird, right? Why would you, what, what did you talk about there? People, right? Who talks like that? I have no time, that's stupid. I have no time, who talks like that? What's that? Okay, so foreigners, right? Who else? Who said children? Yay, it's got the children. Children, right. Foreigners and children talk like that. This is perhaps the most emotionally manipulative moment in the entire first page. Um, and to explain what's going on there, I'll tell a little personal anecdote. So um, my wife is a foreigner. She, she grew up into adulthood in Turkey. Um, and uh, part of why I tell her in the beginning is because she would say things like, are you around with those people? It's really cute. Yeah, you know, um, my little brother, the comedian, right? You've met him already. Um, my little brother uh, came to London to visit because I've been talking about her and he wanted to sort of check her out. And they went to Trafalgar Square together for an afternoon. Um, anyone been to Trafalgar Square? So what's notable about Trafalgar Square? Pigeons everywhere. It's crazy. It's pigeons. If you've been there, it's, 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 it's maniacal. Um, the pigeons are her. My wife was real excited about the pigeons. She grew up in Turkey and she actually raised pigeons. She had um, competitive pigeon contests, pigeon tossing contests as a kid. I never knew that. No, no pigeon tossing. Uh, so she was excited to see what she's going to be here at Cambridge. They had no real pigeons there. They had like ravens. Um, so she was excited to see the pigeons. Uh, and so she gets there with her brother. And 
Um, I still think it's funny. So she gets there and she says to my brother, please wide eyes like a little girl Christmas. Oh, Billy, look at all the chickens. <laughs> and my brother thought that was so funny. Like, I'm into a comic bit, and in fact, he thought it was so funny he didn't correct her. So that she could con continually made that mistake, giving, giving joy each time, like, oh, can I feed the chickens, or how many chickens are there? She gets back to Cambridge that night and starts telling us about the chickens. And it's funny, because they're not chickens, right? They're pigeons. Um, so, so it's cute, right? It's cute because they're like children. When foreigners don't know the words, like children and children, every cell in your body over the gajillion years of evolutionary process is designed to make you want to protect these lovable, sweet, cute children, right? You want you see before you see that you want to hold their hand across the street. You know, it's great. You love them. Now, the second fact about kids besides their cuteness is what? Who said vulnerability? Someone said vulnerability? Yeah. Exactly. So that, I thought that was the exact word in my brain. Um, kids don't know. Kids don't know not to take a fork like an electric socket, right? Like their ball goes on the street, they think, let me get that ball before the car hits. They don't know how to keep themselves alive, right? And they're, they're really always in danger. Um, and you are designed to want to protect the wee ones. That's what you do as a species. Um, so this, this is what this is already this is happening in a very gut way. He's making you love Valentino like a cute kid and fear for him. This is a guy who doesn't know enough not to get himself marked in a parking lot and get mugged, right? Because he's like a kid, he doesn't know. Already, he's fearing for quite a bit. Um, do you have time for like one more bit? Yeah? Okay, I'm going to pretend now, now this is, this is uh, I, will, I will dispense with the illusion of discussion because that's what I will say. Um, so, 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 Door gets repeated twice. Now, if you take any creative writing for it with me, and you wrote this sentence, I have no reason not to answer the door, so I can answer the door, I'd scratch it out. I'd say that's a crap sentence. Right? Like, don't waste your words. I know there's a door, don't say door twice. That's, that's ridiculous. Eggers does it, so you have to go, okay, there's a reason. Um, and doors are actually really interesting conceptually, right? Doors are amazing. Doors are like plots. Door, whenever you enter a door, Something is ending, and something is beginning. Doors are like plots. And so, because he wants you thinking that, like from the start, he's saying, pay attention to space. And so let's look at space. Okay, so we got doors. We got what else? What else do we have? Doors, parking lot, stairs, convenience store. What do these spaces have in common? Yes. Say again. Temporary. So what's your name? Madeline. Madeline. Madeline says they're all temporary. Perfect. Absolutely. These are all spaces. Not only should you not like you stay in them, you'll probably get in trouble, right? Like stairs, you're meant to kind of go up, get out of people's way. Doors, get in and out. Convenience stores designed to zip through as fast as possible. Parking lot, you're supposed to get in and out. Like they're all. Spaces you can't stay. They are the architectural equivalents of homelessness. That is the space you're seeing from the beginning. So all these things are happening without you even realizing it. It's just being pounded into you. Before you even get some love, you've got love, fear, homelessness, subtraction, it's all being pounded in there in these little words so that when the things happen, you're already caring about it, even though you didn't realize it. So I'll, I'll stop here. There's a ton to talk about. In fact, when I teach this book, we spend like the first week on this, just this bit right here, because it's amazing. There's so much going on. Um, so in the, in the next four years, you will learn to read like that. Everything, right? Everything you will learn. Like when your parents call you and they're trying to manipulate you into doing something, like you'll know the techniques you're using on you because you'll learn to be a, a master of uh, manipulative writing. All right. Terrific. And like the book, I learned a lot from the two of you. 
Um, we have about 20 minutes to take questions, to give our advice, etc. I'm going to ask the AV people if you'd bring one microphone over here to this column and one over here to this aisle so students who want to make a comment can be heard. But I'm going to take the privilege of asking the first two questions of my colleagues. I'm going to ask both of them to answer this. Jim, I don't exactly know where you grew up, but I know that Diana Shandy, like me, is a Kansan. And so I find it somewhat stupefying and curious how it is that both of you became interested in issues of human rights and humanitarianism and issues related to Africa. I wonder if you could give us a sense of what in your formative background led you to do the kind of work that you're doing. Um, so, so I've been asked this before because, because it's also because I'm an English professor, so why do I do things like this? And, and the answer is that my professional life for the past, say, 20 years was lit critic. I was a literary critic. I'd read books and write about them, kind of like here, um, which is all about language and how language changes the world. And in my personal life, I was involved in the human rights movement by way of my wife, who comes from a country that has a lot of political turmoil. She lived in a coup or two. She has friends who have been tortured. Um, and so over like 10 years, I'd be talking to these people, hearing their stories, and it was just amazing. And I can remember this one night, this epiphany hit me about seven years ago. I was in Istanbul, it was like three in the morning. It was like really grungy, like old Turkish guy smoking cigarettes. He was sort of telling these stories about the work he'd been doing, getting people out of prison, dealing with the war. Um, and it suddenly struck me two things. One, that people should be hearing his story. These were amazing stories. Every day, these things were happening, and most people didn't know. And then second, that his work was basically language work. It was not significantly different from what I did as a literary critic. As a human rights worker, his job was storytelling. He can't go into a prison with a gun and say, free these people. He can't bring in an army and say, stop this genocide. But he could use words and tell stories and appeal to people's emotions or their shame or write reports and get other people involved. It was all his work was about storytelling. And so at that moment, I realized that as a literary critic, um, what I was doing was much like the work of human rights. And since then, uh, the two have sort of overlapped for me. Um, I find it problematic when, I, when I, I teach courses like Darfur, conflict in human rights in Africa, conflict post-conflict societies in Africa, refugees, humanitarian response. It's, it all seems very grim and kind of depressing and sad. And, um, and that's a part of what I do. I, I focus on Africa, and as an undergraduate, I got er, very early on my first semester at Georgetown. I took a course on Africa and started meeting African students, and I just got very hooked and connected to study in Africa. I spent my junior year abroad in Ivory Coast. So for me, that there's a piece, um, the war, the conflict, uh, is, is a part of this larger perspective, this larger view I have on Africa. But now, since I did my master's work in Namibia, as it got its independence from South Africa, now South Sudan is its own nation. I'm actually now a post-conflict person, more than a conflict and more person. So, um, so it's, a, it's a mix of things. Um, Okay, now it's time for you to get in on the act. We have uh, Robin over here and Ann Minnick here with microphones. I'm going to call on people and let you raise a question, make a comment about the book, etc. Who feels bold? We'll wait. Ann? Um, from a black hole anthropology, Logical perspective, how much of the whole Sudanese conflict is attributable to the whole 19th century European paradigm of French people do stuff for France, British people do stuff for Britain, etc., and the whole great game thought of diplomacy? In 10 words or less. Yeah, that's a, I think. At my office is in the basement of Carnegie, and I invite you to come. Let's have a longer discussion about that. Um, I think there are a lot of perspectives when you look at, we can start naming off which African countries 
um, where conflict exists and whether you want to look at the roots or the seeds of that in, in uh, colonial processes, you want to locate it further back um, with when we get, uh, when we talk about Sudan, we look at early 1800s in South Sudan and you look at Ottoman Empire coming in and raiding South Sudan for gold and ivory. Um, it's a very complex, long process to, to try to unravel or you want to look at it uh, in terms of more contemporary processes. Um, there's not a quick, easy answer to that, but I think it's a great question and I'd be happy to chat with you more about it one-on-one. -on -one. You seem pretty optimistic when you talk about the situation in southern Sudan now that it's independent. Um, in the book, Hachat Dang talks about the SPLA doing some pretty questionable things during that part of the Civil War, and also John Brown is dead, if I recall correctly. And so, given the violence and the SPLA's history, do you think that's, I mean, why are you optimistic about it? Well, I say cautiously optimistic. Um, last year we had the Humphrey professor who was a visiting professor from South Africa. And I thought he made a really interesting point because I had just finished testifying as an expert witness in the trial of um, a young Sudanese man who was going to be deported to Sudan. And this was uh, last fall. And so the idea of this kid who'd been born in, in Sudan um, but really raised in America, being deported and just dropped in South Sudan, or worse, in Khartoum, and said, hey, fed for yourself. Um, on the basis, in part, on the basis of my testimony, he was not deported. Um, I gave a pretty pessimistic account of what I thought was likely to happen. Um, what this, was Humphrey Professor, who's from South Africa, um, what he inserted into the discussion was uh, that that's really what everyone was saying leading up to South African um, black rule. Um, and so I think there needs to be some room and some space for South Sudan to try to figure it out, but every morning that's the first thing I do when I check my email, I go through news reports that are sent to me and I, I'm watching it very closely. Um, I guess what's the option is to just be pessimistic. Um, you, you hope, right? And um, but yeah, there are a lot of indicators that, that there are some major problems. Well, I just have a, a bromide. Um, so Noam Chomsky, do you want me to know Noam Chomsky? He's got this great line where he talks about hope, and he says, you know, things look bad, um, and you have two choices. You can choose not to hope, and then guarantee basically that the absolute worst will happen, because your hopelessness deactivates you. Or you can choose to hope, and then maybe, maybe some small good, some small pain will be made. So in a sense, it doesn't really matter what actually you think, it's almost like a moral obligation to hope. Question over here. Hi. So, um, a couple of my fellow students and I, we weren't really discussing it too heavily. We were talking about some of uh, the, the last couple of pages of the book, and um, some of us were sort of sensing religious overtones, or some of us were sensing more like humanistic and general objective moral type messages. So, I was just wondering what your take was on perhaps what the I guess the perceived theme was to be, according to those last pages, if you felt there were any like religious overtones at all. And I guess it was making a commentary on any, um, uh, on I guess countries' international engagement or lack thereof. Professor Dawes is cramming the last couple of pages. <laughs> um, well, so what, what I always say about the last pages is it's about, um, so I'm going to totally dodge your question. I don't know about the religious part. I'd have to think about that. But there is something sacred, maybe, um, about the act of speaking and being heard. And this is about making one, if he can make his fictional self palpably real to you privileged white Westerners, or some of you privileged white Westerners, um, <laughs> that, 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 that can be something that changes lives for people. But I will say, right before walking in, our, our, our colleague Anne pointed out that at the end, it ends by a, by a really interesting set of repetitions. 
I will, I will, I will. Um, and I think that ties into this last question. This, this man who's got no reason to believe he can actually do something. No reason. Life hasn't taught him that he can actually achieve what he wants. He will, though. He will choose to hope. Um, and so if that's part of what you're taking with the, the religious incantatory process, I, I, I buy that. And I think that's why I found it optimistic. Um, people on the committee were like, you thought that was optimistic? You thought that was more optimistic than that Zaytun? And I think it's because, in spite of everything, he is hopeful. He is going to continue to attempt and try whatever the motivation, whether it's religious or not. He, he, he says at some point, I've given up on God. I, you know, there is no God for me. I think that was a dark moment. Maybe not. I don't know. But I do think ultimately, about five minutes left. I'm wondering if there is a question or comment here. And what would like to So, what do you guys think is the what? <laughs> associated with uh, Northern Sudan. Um, if anyone's familiar with the work of uh, Mahmoud Mamdani and his book on saviors and survivors, it focuses on Darfur. I think it gets um, very political, very difficult to, uh, to speak about this in, in broad generalities in terms of um, how Islam is invoked and uh, brought and cast in a, in a very negative light. Um, so I, it's hard to answer, for me to answer this in a politic way, not getting myself very quickly in trouble. Do you have a, a quick say you can come in from the side and save me on that one? Okay. So um, there is actually one answer to that question. Um, <laughs> and it, it take, how much time is there? It's like we're out of time, right? We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but, but I'll, get, I'll get back to you. We, we are, in fact, out of time. Before we, before we adjourn to our small groups, I would like the members of the Math Beats Committee who helped select this book to please stand and let us share our appreciation for their help. Thank you all for your time, for your attention. Enjoy the discussion that will now take place.